Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today's briefing, examining the social determinants of health, measures, evidence, and policy solutions. I'm Devin Lada, Policy Associate at the Alliance for Health Policy. For those who are not familiar with the Alliance, welcome. We are a nonpartisan resource for the policy community dedicated to advancing knowledge and understanding of health policy issues. We'd like to thank today's sponsor, the Commonwealth Fund, for their generous support. You can join today's conversation on Twitter using the hashtag AllHealthLive and join our community at AllHealthPolicy, as well as on Facebook and LinkedIn. Today's panel has a Q&A section at the end of the hour. We want you all to be active participants, so please get your questions ready. You should see a dashboard at the right of your web browser that has a speech bubble icon with a question mark. You can use that speech bubble icon to submit questions you have for the panelists at any time. We will collect these and address them during the broadcast. Throughout the webinar, you can also chat about any technical issues you may be experiencing, and someone will attempt to help. Now I'm excited to introduce Rachel Nuzza. Rachel is Senior Vice President for Federal and State Health Policy at the Commonwealth Fund. Rachel works closely with policymakers at the state and federal level and is responsible for developing and implementing the fund's national policy strategy. In addition to leading the fund's federal and state policy program, she oversees the fund's work on COVID-19 and public health modernization and co-leads the fund's behavioral focus area. Rachel has over 20 years of experience working in health policy at the federal, state, and local levels of government, as well as in the private sector. Rachel, we're excited to have you here with us, and I turn the stage over to you. Thank you so much, Devin. And thank you to everyone at the Alliance. And thanks to all of you for joining us for this important discussion around the social drivers of health, the economic and social factors that impact health outcomes and costs, as well as health inequities. We know that there's a well-established body of research that's confer that confirms that those experiencing social and economic risk, risk factors have worse health outcomes, increased use of health care, significantly higher health care costs, poor mental health, and are more likely to experience racism. We also have evidence that shows that addressing social drivers of health can improve health outcomes more cost-effectively and equitably than medical interventions alone. We also know that efforts to move to traditional measures of value-based care without addressing drivers of health and health equity could exacerbate access barriers and worsen racial disparities. There have been significant policy developments around social drivers in the last few years, and it's a really exciting time to talk about the progress we've made so far and where we're headed. With the publication of the 2023 Physician Fee Schedule, the final rule, we saw major wins for drivers of health measurement and payment across two major programs in CMS, the Merit-Based Incentive Payment System and the Medicare Shared Savings Program. These are the first ever federal drivers of health measures focused on screening for food insecurity, housing instability, transportation issues, utility needs, and interpersonal safety. We've also seen CMS approving a number of new waivers addressing health-related social needs at the state level. We'll hear more about those later today. We've seen CMMI models that are increasingly examining and addressing drivers of health. And um, the National Committee on Quality Assurance just adopted its first social needs screening and intervention measure. Momentum is building as policymakers at all levels realize what is possible if we measure and pay for what we ultimately value, the health of all Americans. Now I'd like to quickly introduce our audience to today's exciting lineup of panelists that are gonna help us walk through all of these issues. Their full bios are included in the webinar materials. First, we have Dr. Rakaya Yerby. She's the inaugural Kara, T. Tr Kara J. Trott Professor in Law at the Meritz College of Law and a faculty affiliate of the Kerwin Institute at The Ohio State University. She's also a co-founder and a faculty affiliate of the Institute for Health, Healing, Justice, and Equity. Next, we have Dr. Shantanu Agarwal, Chief Health Officer at Elevance Health, where he oversees the enterprise whole health strategy, including medical policy, clinical quality, and delegation oversight, as well as industry-leading work to address health-related social needs and health equity. Next, we'll hear from Ms. Melinda Dutton, partner at Minat Health. Melinda brings deep knowledge and experience in publicly financed healthcare, including Medicaid, CHIP, and the Affordable Health Care Act, coverage expansion, delivery system transformation, and payment reform. 
Melinda guides federal and state regulators, local governments, providers, payers, life science companies, and foundations. Melinda and Manette have been a longstanding partner of the fund and an expert in the area of social drivers and health. Finally, we have Dr. Cameron Webb, a physician, attorney, and political candidate from Virginia. He currently serves as the White House Senior Policy Advisor for COVID-19 and equity in the Biden administration. Again, all of the full bios are available as part of the webinar resources, but for now, let's get started with the conversation. So Dr. Yerby, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, and let's go to the next slide. Today, I'm gonna to talk about the social driver of health, structural racism, and health justice. Next slide. This is a roadmap. I'm going to give examples throughout my talk about neighborhood and built environment and economic stability, and hopefully get to a discussion of the ways that we can begin to address these health inequities. Next slide. The social driver of health inequities is structural discrimination, and that's the ways that laws, policies, and practices are used to structure systems. As I mentioned, I'm going to talk about neighborhood and built environment and economic stability to advantage the majority and disadvantage minority individuals. It also includes the ways that organizations work together to create separate and independent barriers through the neutral denial of equal treatment that results from the normal operation operations of institutions and in society. And unlike most of what we talk about in terms of discrimination, it does not require bad intent. Next slide. Today, I'm going to focus particularly on structural racism, but I want to highlight that social risk factors include all of the identities that we share, which includes race, sexual orientation, ability, disability status, class, gender identity. Today, I'm just going to focus on one because of the limited time that we have today to talk about these issues. Next slide. When we look at predominantly black neighborhoods, they usually have less economic investment, fewer resources such as places to exercise and play, uh, which is associated with higher rates of cardiovascular disease risk for black women, more pollution, noise, and overcrowded housing stock. And this is in part due to laws that allow for residential segregation. Many of those laws have been struck down but we still see law gaps in the federal housing laws that allow neighborhoods to be disproportionately racially segregated. I'm not gonna go into those today. What I do wanna focus on, however, is a lack of access to clean water for urban and rural areas that disproportionately harms racial and ethnic minorities. Next slide. So as you see here on this slide, it is a picture of uh, Amanda Larson, who is in Navajo Nation. And what we see is that there is a lack of federal law addressing access to clean water. Not only does this impact people throughout rural and urban areas, but it disproportionately harms Native American, Indigenous Americans, because they are relying on the federal government to ensure that they have access to clean water, which is not happening. Next slide. As I mentioned, there are gaps in the, the federal law when we talk about housing. One of the main gaps is the failure to require um, safe and healthy housing. As a result, many, uh, many individuals, racial and ethnic minorities, as well as rural, uh, lack access to clean water. This has been associated with increased rates of respiratory disease, as well as increased rates of COVID-19, because if you can imagine, if you do not have clean water, you don't have an opportunity uh, to wash your hands or um, sanitary conditions. Next slide. So my summary is that in terms of housing, because of laws uh, that allowed for residential segregation, because of the current gaps in federal anti-discrimination law, as well as state anti-discrimination law, we still have increased rates of racial residential segregation, 
Uh, many of these neighborhoods lack economic investment. There's no federal laws regarding right to clean water and plumbing. And there's a failure to enforce the state laws regarding health and safe housing. This disproportionately impacts racial and ethnic minorities, as well as the poor. And the outcomes we see are racial inequities in health and well-being, particularly during the COVID-19 um, pandemic. Next slide. I want to turn now to economic stability. Today, I'm going to just focus on three laws in three areas of the law, but there are many gaps within employment discrimination laws. Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 prohibits, among other things, race and sex discrimination. The Equal Pay Act of 1963 prohibits sex discrimination, and state equal pay laws uh, prohibit sex discrimination. Now, I want to start off by acknowledging there are already gaps um, in these laws, particularly under Title VII, because of how courts have interpreted most of them will only allow you to bring a lawsuit for one form of discrimination. So if you are a Black woman, it is very hard for you to bring a lawsuit under Title VII claiming both race and sex discrimination. The Equal Pay Act is great, but again, it prohibits uh, Black women from bringing a, a discrimination case based on race. They would only be able to bring a case under sex discrimination and be compared, their pay to be compared with that of Black men, which are often also not paid as much as white men. Next slide. So as I've mentioned, there are gaps in these laws. And so what does that look like in terms of employment? We see, for example, that based on employment, salary history and hiring data, that many companies have used prior salary history to pay racial and ethnic minorities less than white men. The same is true for women even though racial and ethnic minority individuals were doing the same job as white men and had the same qualifications. Evidence also show that companies channeled racial and ethnic minorities into lower paying careers compared to white individuals, and we tend to see uh, this happening in tech jobs. A 2018 study found black job seekers were penalized for trying to negotiate equal or higher salaries than their white counterparts. And we saw studies that showed the same thing for women. And so what I wanna highlight is that law can be a tool for structural discrimination, which allows for um, employers to act co collectively or individual employers to be able to pay people less, even though they are doing the same or work as white men. We see this associated with depression in women and higher rates of job stress and post-traumatic stress. And it also has been associated with low birth weight babies for African-American women, uh, which has been one of the leading causes of infant mortality. Next slide. Now, I do want to pull out um, another group that is affected by these issues, and that is home health aides. They provide activities with, uh, they provide services for individuals with activities of daily living in their home. Almost two thirds of home health care workers are racial and ethnic minorities. They are traditionally paid through Medicaid reimbursement. They are more likely to be in poverty. They have higher rates of injury than construction workers. And we tend to see that they are not covered by many of the health and safety protections offered, um, which includes workers' comp, as well as paid sick leave. Next slide. So in summary for employment, I want to highlight that employment laws allow employers to pay women and racial and ethnic minorities less than their white male counterparts, even though they are doing the same job. Employment protections often do not apply to jobs of racial and ethnic minority workers, um, such as home health care workers. 
disproportionately impacted racial and ethnic minority workers, including women of color. And what we tend to see is higher rates of inequities in health and well being, as I mentioned, depression, higher rates of injuries. And we have also seen this during the COVID 19 um, pandemic. Next slide. And so what I offer to you is just a brief discussion of the health justice framework that I have worked uh, with others to create. And so that requires that legal and policy responses must include truth and reconciliation process that acknowledges the existence of racism and provides a mechanism to overcome trauma, impact that communities like home healthcare workers should be leading and driving the change, and that we must provide healthcare and financial supports to be able to redress the harm that they have suffered. Next slide. Um, they're gonna share the slide so you can see the specifics that I have provided for each neighborhood and built environment. Next slide. And eco economic stability. Next slide. But I wanna leave you with just a couple of citations to articles that you can go ahead and pull and feel free to email me if you want more information. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rakaya. That was that was really um, really invaluable um, background. Um, Shantanu, we're going to turn it over to you. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, and I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here uh, and to be joined uh, to join these other panelists. Um, so, in many respects, I'm going to pick up uh, from the perspective that you're just hearing about, um, but. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. All right, hopefully now you can also see me. Uh, in many respects, I'm gonna pick up uh, on the perspective you were just hearing and, and um, try to discuss how a, an organization like Elevance Health really uh, thinks about addressing um, uh, social drivers of health and, and what we feel like we are capable of doing to uh, address these needs. Um, next slide, please. First, one thing I will say uh, for some context, uh, in case uh, viewers are not aware, listeners are not aware, is just what Elevance Health is. So we were formerly known as Anthem. We are a health benefits and health services company. Uh, we serve about 47 million or so people around the country uh, across numerous different populations, so uh, including uh, employer-sponsored insurance, Medicare, Medicaid, and the individual marketplace. Uh, and uh, you know, we certainly view strategically addressing whole health um, to be a major pillar of ours. And so that means addressing the, the physical health needs of our members, their behavioral or mental health needs, and uh, equally importantly, their social health needs. Uh, next slide, please. So what that uh, has really meant for us is first better understanding the social needs of our members. You know, oftentimes you will hear in this field that there's a certain amount of, or a good amount of social risk data uh, that that the ecosystem has access to, and certainly th there is access to data, but it is generally at the environmental or population level. So, you know, oftentimes you can think about the area deprivation index or the social vulnerability index. These are uh, publicly available uh, data that um, occur at various population uh, levels, whether it's a zip code or a neighborhood or, or otherwise. Um, you know, in our perspective, certainly that is not sufficient in order to be able to address the individual needs of our members and to really know what the, the individual needs are. Uh, in many respects, I often compare addressing social needs with population level data to being like addressing hypertension with population level data. It is not sufficient. It can help you uh, target uh, your uh, interventions uh, or approaches by uh, first identifying the overall neighborhoods and population uh, that may face various social vulnerabilities. But then you really do have to get at that individual level and really be able to address their hypertension or their social needs. Doing otherwise might actually be insufficient or perhaps even dangerous. So one way that we have sought to understand the uh, individual needs of our members is to conduct a, a a, uh, a statistical survey. Uh, and this was a, a first uh, initiative that uh, we rolled out at the end of last year and has continued well into this year. Um, what I'm actually sharing on this slide is data with you from a survey of our Medicare Advantage and uh, commercially insured members. We are actually in the midst of conducting a similar survey for our Medicaid members. But there are a few findings here that I think are very interesting. First, um, in this 
population uh, both in Indiana and Georgia, we found that there were a number of members who reported having at least one social need. Um, and, you know, roughly th that was equivalent between the commercially insured and Medicare Advantage. So about 70% of all the members that we spoke with reported having at least one need and then uh, oftentimes more than one. And we divided those needs up into nine different areas that are shown on the slide. But you can see how common some of the needs are. So uh, healthcare insecurity, for example, uh, not being able to afford their health care or getting access to sufficient care um, well, was frequently highlighted. Uh, other uh, aspects of financial strain were frequently highlighted, as was food insecurity. And we did uh, compare our survey findings to nationally available data, and in many respects, uh, it was quite similar, um, although, you know, there were some needs that I think rose to the top in our sample. And we also did see some differences by geography. And so what that really tells us is, again, it I think reinforces the notion that you really have to assess at needs at an individual level, that they can vary for a variety of reasons. And what we are still very interested in, and, and I don't think we've got a great answer to, is how often needs change. So how often does a member population have to be um, resurveyed in order to update and understand what their needs are. I will also say, you know, once we had access to this kind of data, we could, of course, uh, analyze it against the other kinds of data that we have, like claims and, and access to registries and, and other information. And, of course, found that with every report, reported social need, there was a, uh, an association with worsened uh, mental and physical health and association with changing healthcare utilization, uh, for example, uh, more use of uh, the emergency department and and higher healthcare spending. We actually saw that each need added incremental impact in each of these areas with a particular inflection point once a member reported having three or more needs. And so this work has definitely started informing our thinking deeply and we have taken various steps um, because you know conducting a statistical sample is actually quite challenging. And so what we are really working towards is being able to uh, get this data uh, at a member level more routinely, working through our standard uh, processes and operations as we engage with members, uh, for example, through, through case management, uh, but also working really closely with providers. And we have actually created a provider incentive program for them to be able to conduct social screening on our behalf and get that data back to us. Next slide, please. So, you know, obviously then the question becomes, well, once we have this information, what can we do about it? And again, I think we really created a strong case internally that uh, these social needs are highly related to poor health outcomes, to poor quality outcomes, to uh, poorer value for our spend and indeed higher spend. Um, and so it is very, uh, addressing social needs, I would certainly argue, is extremely business aligned. Um, I think addressing health equity overall is extremely business aligned for a variety of reasons. It is yet another uh, reason why all organizations like us and, and frankly all organizations should address these areas. Um, and, and so what we have worked to do is to create what we are calling the community connected care solution. So at, at the most elemental level, what this solution seeks to do is again combine social risk information and data uh, at the member level and at the population level, there clearly is a role for population data to help target uh, and focus needs and identify priorities. But, but again, we want to drill that down to the individual member level and really understand the health impact of social needs. Um, uh, and, and, you know, I, I, I've already discussed the variety of data points that we're trying to gather. We, we did, I should just say, we didn't want to create our own social needs survey. We really looked outside at uh, validated surveys, and so we have uh, basically adopted one of them throughout our enterprise in order to gather this social data and make sure that it is consistent across processes. Using that information, then, we, of course, work directly with the member, and, um, you know, I think it's really important to conduct a, uh, a you know, a, a, an assessment alongside the member using the validated survey, but then also go beyond it in order to really understand what's driving their social needs. Uh, and then once we have that information, we can, of course, point the member to solutions. So we can point them first internally to our own benefits. Um, you know, across many of our products, we offer supplemental benefits, value-added benefits, which are, are quite often geared towards addressing social needs. And so that really is the first place to make sure the member is using the benefits that they already have access to. Second, uh, we think about 
uh, sending them to a variety of external solutions. And I'll, I'll get into some of what those are in the next slide. And finally, I'll, and I'll actually address this later in the talk, um, we have created solutions called Life Essential Kits for our own associates that we can actually utilize once we have a better understanding of what the member or associate's uh, social needs are. And then finally, as I briefly mentioned earlier, we are actually curating a network of providers to both uh, assess social needs and get them addressed in the community. And this is quite often where community-based organizations uh, come in. And, and so, you know, again, our view is we have to uh, assess and address these social needs in order to meet the whole health needs of our members. And that when we do that, we actually make it more feasible for their health to be improved in the behavioral dimension and in the physical health dimension. And that's ultimately where we get to the highest value care for all of our members. Next slide, please. So this is just a little bit more detail on the various steps that I laid out. I, I won't go into um, all of the details here, but again, you know, it, data is a really important driver of what we do because it helps point us in the right direction and gets us, uh, we hope, in front of the right members. There are a variety of approaches we take um, to getting and assessing somebody's social history. And of course, with the other data that we have at our disposal as a health benefits company, we can then uh, combine that data uh, in predictive analytics models and other approaches. So again, we, we are trying to prioritize uh, and work with the right set of members. And then, you know, quite often, we have other processes that are already engaging with members, for example, case management processes or uh, health risk assessments that we're doing, uh, other customer service processes. And so we are working to create the right linkages so that if any of those uh, Elevance Health employees get the sense that a member has a social need, they can either uh, kick off a screening or do a warm handoff to one of our social counselors and get that screening done. We also have created a, a tool called the Whole Health Index um, that we're actually working to publish on externally so that uh, we're being transparent about it, but that seeks to bring together information uh, at an individual member level to show what their needs may be on a physical dimension, on a behavioral health dimension, and on a social dimension. And so again, uh, moving to the middle column, there's a variety of uh, engagement approaches that we have. So we, we are embedding social screening and referral in our digital platform uh, that's called Sydney, and that's, that's the standard mobile app that all of our members have access to. Uh, we have telephonic counseling resources, and we're actually working to create more virtual and face-to-face -face counseling resources as well. And then uh, once we have that understanding at a member level, we can, of course, um, uh, get them connected to a variety of resources, uh, as I previously discussed. Next slide, please. So actually, let me end. I mean, the Community Connected Care Program is relatively new. We actually worked to build it earlier this year. We've been scaling it. We started in Medicaid uh, for probably clear reasons. Um, that solution is currently rolled out in 13 of our Medicaid markets. And we've gone from uh, essentially conducting very few risk screenings to now having conducted over 100,000 social screens uh, in this year alone. We will be working to expand that solution uh, into all of our Medicaid markets or the remainder next year, working to expand it into Medicare, and of course, looking at other uh, population segments like our individual marketplace members as well. Um, er results are still quite early, so I, I completely agree with the earlier discussion that uh, a variety of publications and peer-reviewed uh, publications have shown that uh, assessing and addressing social needs truly are value-driving and, and health Improving. Um, we will be uh, collecting that data internally and reporting it uh, externally as well. Uh, I thought, though, I would tell you about a program that we've built specifically for our own associates because that's been in place for longer and um, actually has gotten to uh, the, the stage of being able to show clear results, which I think are really exciting. So uh, about a year and a half to two years ago, we actually conducted a social risk screening of our own associates. Um, using, again, validated tools and really sought to understand what their needs were. This was obviously in the, in the midst of the pandemic, and um, we knew uh, as a leadership team that social needs were no, no doubt worsening and changing. And what we found is that a significant number of our associates reporting ha reported having needs in three major dimensions. First, you know, quite, quite critically, they did reflect um, national averages and, and did express um, uh, really concerning food insecurity. Uh, a second need that they expressed was 
playing um, the role of a caretaker, a caregiver for either uh, elderly parents or children. And so they needed more support uh, as a caregiver. And third, they also reported transportation insecurity. And, and again, that's pretty typical when you look at national social risk data. And so what we did to address their needs is created what we called life essential kits. So there's three uh, LEKs, one in each of these dimensions, that offered a specific benefit. So the nutrition kit, for example, offered a monthly grocery allowance um, that the associate could use in a variety of stores in order to supplement um, you know, their, their grocery buying power and, and be able to supplement their nutrition at home. We had similar uh, approaches for the other two domains. And, and I will tell you that even when, let's say transportation security was reported by the associate, the, uh, the vast majority of our associates um, actually chose the nutrition life essential kit. Um, so that became the overwhelming choice of over 90% of the associates who qualified. And next slide, please. And so what we did is we actually followed these associates. And what you see on this slide is data after about one year of following them. We now have data for two years and we've submitted that data for uh, publication in a peer reviewed journal that's currently under review. So just to share with you the, the first year of findings, what we actually did first is uh, constructed a uh, control group working with our employer-sponsored insurance customers. So looking at other employers, we found similarly matched associates uh, and actually tracked um, uh, survey data where we you know, uh, regularly surveyed all of the involved associates, both in the intervention arm and in the control arm. And we, of course, tracked healthcare claims and other utilization patterns. And what we found is that this intervention was uh, really led to uh, remarkably significant results. We saw in the intervention population, a, and these are all statistically significant findings, a decrease in overall medical expenses, uh, a decrease in emergency department visits and hospitalizations. We also found an increase in outpatient um, uh, clinical appointments. Uh, an increase in the use of virtual care. And even among the outpatient appointments, we found that they skewed towards regular outpatient visits, not urgent care visits. Uh, and then of course, at the same time, we were gathering the uh, survey uh, data that were reported by the associates. And there was a statistical, statistically significant rise in reporting mental health and well-being, a decrease in anxiety, a decrease in uh, depression. And so, we have really packaged that at this point in a, in a publication and it's currently under review and you can see some of the quotes that we got from the survey on the right. We are continuing to work in this area with our own associates. Um, we're actually building onto the Life Essential Kit uh, nutrition counseling for next year and then we're also working to create uh, another program that can get associates connected to social resources as they need, really bringing together the community connected care program with what we're also doing for our associates. So thank you again for the opportunity to, to talk about our work and uh, I'll be happy to engage in discussion and take questions. Thank you much, so much Shantanu, that was uh, really terrific. Um, now we're gonna turn it over to Melinda. Hi, um, thank you, that really was terrific. And um, um, uh, I feel like the, there's a great kind of continuing conversation happening here, um, starting with the um, the very broad structural issues, structural racism, environmental structural issues, moving towards the more tactical in terms of how um, one leading health plan is addressing um, uh, the issues within the healthcare system and bridging over to the social services system. And then what I'm going to talk about today is how that's playing out for state Medicaid programs. And um, in my work, I work a lot. Um, I've um, Over my 30-year career, I've really focused on um, uh, the Medicaid program and, and related government financed healthcare programs. And I work a lot with state governments as well as other stakeholders who are trying to improve the care for people who are uh, receive coverage under Medicaid and CHIP um, and related programs. And um, increasingly that work has been focused on addressing drivers of health. And if we could go to the next slide, that'd be great. Um, and I'm gonna be clear, I'm gonna be a little tactical um, in terms of what we are seeing states doing and lift up um, where we see some um, trends that are promising and also where there remain some challenges um, in integrating um, efforts to address drivers of health into the healthcare continuum. Um, Medicaid is a healthcare program. Um, it is 
um, under its federal um, authority, it is to um, uh, provide access to coverage and care, um, health care, and improve health um, for people enrolled in Medicaid. And historically, the assumption has been that, that, that the program is very much focused on health care, delivery of health care services. Um, increasingly, based on the um, uh, uh, growing body of research that both speakers have talked about, there is a focus on um, how do we not just in, improve health care delivery, improve access to health care, but improve health. And for um, Medicaid, which is a program that's a means-tested program, by definition, people enrolled in Medicaid have um, um, low or moderate incomes and or um, higher health care needs. Um, that is a population that's disproportionately vulnerable to drivers of health that um, can negatively impact their health outcome and, and um, even uh, life expectancy. So um, as we work with Medicaid programs and other stakeholders to think about um, how do we bridge between the health care delivery system and um, the um, social services system and, and environmental factors that, that impact health, um, we think about kind of three different legs of the stool here. Um, one is measurement. What, how do we find out what we're doing, what, what, the, um, what people's needs are, how we're, um, to what extent we're meeting those needs. Um, two is payment. Um, how are the um, uh, incentives aligned within Medicaid um, financing and um, other sources of funding? Um, to uh, facilitate efforts to address drivers of health. And then finally, infrastructure. Um, and this is recognizing this gap that exists between our healthcare delivery system and our um, human services or social services delivery systems within communities. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're seeing in terms of state ep um, efforts to uh, address these three legs of the stool um, across the country. So let's go to the next slide, please. Um, this is just a, a very high-level frame, framework for um, organizing some of the emerging practices across the country. As, as, and I'm going to go in a little bit more deeply into each of these in a moment, but just to orient ourselves. Um, you know, as I said before, um, because Medicaid is a means-tested uh, means program, it's covering 80 million people in this country. That includes um, half of births, um, half of all children. Um, it is uh, disproportionately um, the uh, coverage vehicle for um, people of color in this country. It's um, one-fifth of our national um, health expenditures. It's an enormously important program. And, and um, it's also a program that's a joint state and federal program. So um, while there are federal parameters related to its implementation, states have flexibility in terms of how they want to implement the program within their states, so long as they're within those federal parameters states have um, a fair amount of flexibility. So it's different than Medicare or even commercial insurance um, in that we have these, um, a, a very large number of, of folks receiving coverage within the states and we have this flexibility in state policy levers to try to craft programs to address social needs. Um, we've seen states dive into the, to addressing um, social needs across kind of these three um, areas. First, in terms of identifying reporting on social needs, I'm going to get to it in a second, but it, um, over 30 states right now are screening or assessing people for social needs already. Um, so that it, we can see that it's enormously important priority for states um, for a variety of reasons. Um, what happens after that is, is, is more emergent in terms of what do we do with that information, how do we respond to those needs. We do see that it's very common and frankly historically has been built in for certain types of um, programs and services within Medicaid to integrate um, social needs into efforts to care management. Um, and increasingly, we're seeing efforts, particularly through managed care, to um, grow the workforce who bring skills to bridge between health and human services and to increase access to human services beyond the traditional health, traditional health care environment, um, including through the use of community health workers and partnerships with community-based organizations. All the way over to the right, this is the area that I think is the, is the hardest and the biggest lift and where um, efforts are most emergent. Um, but um, we are also seeing efforts, primarily through 1115 waivers, which I'm going to talk about in a moment, to invest in and engage in the community um, and to create the kind of infrastructure that we need to, to create sustainable bridging across our health and human services systems. 
So at its most base form, we're seeing Medicaid increasingly paying for services that are delivered in the community, non-traditional, non-medical services that um, have an evidence base um, showing that they can improve health. Um, and we're also seeing Medicaid programs investing in infrastructure like data exchanges, um, uh, capacity building for community-based organizations to expand um, the range of services that they're able to offer to help facilitate um, uh, health improvements within um, among Medicaid populations. I'm going to go into each of these in a little bit more detail. So let's go to the next slide. I'm going to start with screening, and, and um, Dr. Agarwal talked about the screening efforts within um, Elevance. And um, similarly, states are really prioritizing screening. This map reflects the review of Medicaid managed care contracts across the country. And the bright colors mean that that state is in some way requiring um, screening um, for their Medicaid populations for drivers of health. Um, how they're doing it varies. You can see in the in the blue, um, those states have said, we want screening within specific domains, for example, housing. Um, you can see in the gold, those are the, the, um, states that have said, we want specific screening instruments, use this instrument to do it. Um, so there's some variation in how they're um, doing the screening, but you can see overwhelmingly, um, states are moving towards requiring screening as part of a baseline assessment of people enrolled in Medicaid um, to help ideally inform their care plan and potentially provide population level information that can um, help states and their partners, plans, and providers improve the delivery of care um, to their populations. A challenge that we have here is you can see that the gold boxes are around those states where there are um, where reporting is required related to those screens. So um, we are um, Screening, um, doing a lot of screening, we aren't sure exactly what um, is coming from that screening and to what extent um, the, uh, our interventions are impacting um, the outcomes for, for individuals who have been impacted by um, drivers of health that put their health at risk. Um, that's largely driven by um, a lack of standardization. Um, at this point, Rachel mentioned at the top of the call, we've seen some real progress in the last year in efforts to create more standardized measurement uh, tools for um, screening, um, identifying positive screens, and then taking action on those positive screens related to drivers of health. Um, there are not standardized measures, though, yet in Medicaid programs. And so we have some states creating homegrown measures. Um, um, other states looking at the new NCQA measure that was just released in the last year. Um, but um, this is an area that is a, that hamstrings states' efforts to both um, structure interventions on an individual level and also be responsive on a population health level to um, what we're learning from these screenings that are happening. Let's go to the next slide, please. Um, it is common for states to specify in their efforts um, uh, populations and or domains um, that state Medicaid programs want to prioritize in terms of making an impact. And um, this is in part because um, uh, a desire to not try to boil the ocean. The, the process of addressing drivers of health within the, in the Medicaid program um, is complex and requires investment and policy change. And so we see States often prioritizing among specific populations and domains, particularly where there's an evidence base or reason to believe that those interventions can be successful. You can see um, on the left hand side women and pregnant um, or parenting people, children, um, members with high needs, those with behavioral health conditions, homeless members, those are among the most common um, populations that states have focused on in their efforts to address drivers of health. On the right hand side, housing and food always rank at the top. And, um, housing is an area where there is, it's among, has among the strongest evidence base for showing that housing interventions can actually improve health outcomes. Of course, it's also one of the hardest things to solve um, uh, from, from, in terms of the use of Medicaid resources. Um, food is, it also has a very strong evidence base and is, and is a very common um, domain that states have prioritized in their Medicaid efforts. Go to the next slide, please. Um, so we've screened someone, we've identified that they have a need. Um, potentially we've even um, assessed to get underneath the hood of that need and understand um, what assistance they might need. 
then what happens? Um, and this, I think, is what um, in many conversations with providers, with community-based um, uh, organizations, with others, um, the concern is we're screening, but then sending folks on a road to nowhere. We don't have the infrastructure or the services or the payment mechanisms in order to um, do something about the information that we get through those screenings. And um, there are some pretty serious barriers in, in this regard. Um, that we have a cultural divide between our health and human services systems. We don't have, we, the, both, or, um, so that they, their kind of priorities and, and missions um, can, can be different um, and um, create uh, difficulty in communication and aligning on efforts. Um, there's limited data sharing across the two um, health and human services and um, uh, systems. Funding streams and the way organizations get paid are completely different. They speak different languages. Um, and then really critically, there's a lack of investment. I mean, our social safety net is frayed. Um, and um, I'm sure folks are uh, well aware of the um, documentation of the um, under-resourcing of our social safety net in the United States compared to other countries. And that lopsidedness can create structural inequities within um, the even the negotiation processes between health um, organizations and and CBOs and and create lots of barriers to kind of bridging and enabling there to be um, uh, a support system to um, intervene and provide um, uh, assistance to individuals who are identified as needing um, social supports to address their health related social needs. Let's go to the next slide. Um, the states are taking a variety of, uh, using a variety of strategies to try to help create this bridge. Um, uh, some are very simple. Some are, you know, within their managed care contracts, um, just uh, requiring the plans to create partnerships. I'm sure many of, a, of us have heard about closed loop referral platforms um, that have, um, there are a number of them that have emerged and are helping to provide um, a common data exchange for referrals to um, from healthcare organizations to social services organizations, and then the closing of that loop, reporting back on what those findings are. Um, uh, and all of those are incrementally helpful. Um, also, uh, uh, um, we're also seeing emerging um, uh, what I'm calling here community care hubs, and we recently released a report that talks about this more broadly, but basically community-based organizations coming together and sharing and centralizing administrative and operational infrastructure but also um, uh, uh, putting together networks of social services that then can be made available to health um, partners, whether those be plans or provider organizations, um, to, try to, to help accelerate the ability of um, organizations, CBOs, to participate in these types of collaborations. And um, we're seeing that um, North Carolina's waiver is an example of where they've deployed that strategy, but we know that that's um, happening in other parts of the country as well. Um, so that's one way that we're seeing some states start to um, seek to create some more infrastructure in order to um, uh, be able to address social needs once they're identified. Next slide, please. Um, I've mentioned waivers a couple of times, and I'm going to, um, after this slide, I'm going to talk about, um, there are a variety of authorities that uh, under Medicaid to address social needs outside of waivers, but certainly um, the 1115 waivers addressing drivers of health are, are the headline getters. Um, and that's because there are limitations within um, the federal authority, federal Medicaid authority in order in, in to, um, limitations on the ability to make the investments that are needed to address drivers of health. Um, 1115 is a provision in the Medicaid statute that um, allows the federal government to waive certain aspects, certain limitations within federal law to give states um, uh, flexibility to test new models um, and um, where those new models can improve health um, and further the, the purpose of the Medicaid statute. We've highlighted a bunch of states here that um, have had 1115 waivers. I want to note that um, these waivers require a partnership um, an agreement between um, CMS, the federal government, federal regulators, and, and the state Medicaid programs. Um, North Carolina is a state I've worked a lot with. Their 1115 approval came from the prior administ administration, the Trump administration. Um, it, they were authorized um, to use up to $650 million in Medicaid funding over five years um, 
to uh, launch pilots around the state where the Medicaid program is paying for um, 27 different health-related social services, such as food boxes and, um, and um, support for um, people experiencing interpersonal violence, um, housing assistance, um, and, and other, a whole other range of services. And, and the, through that pilot, Medicaid dollars are um, being set aside and provided to health plans who are responsible for managing the care of um, people enrolled in Medicaid and to ensure them access to those services. And, and as I said before, using community care hubs to do that. Um, most recently, just this past year, we've seen just a flood of um, new approvals. Um, Oregon, Arizona, Massachusetts, California, Vermont. Um, I don't have Arkansas in here. They're another recent one. Um, New York has a, a waiver renewal where they're seeking to implement the hub model that I just um, mentioned in kind of a North Carolina style. Um, I'm, uh, we have other states like Washington and Rhode Island that have existing waivers that um, uh, focus on addressing drivers of health. So. The 1115 waiver demonstrations have really accelerated the ability of states to test new models. Um, and I think will increasingly be of interest to other states, um, given their potential to enable states to use dollars in ways to, um, for example, fund infrastructure for building that community capacity, um, which normally would not be a way that Medicaid dollars could be used, and also to fund certain types of services um, that would not be possible on, um, under the Medicaid statute. Um, and then finally, having said that, I want to acknowledge that, um, next slide please, beyond um, the, w the waivers, Medicaid does, as I started out saying, Medicaid has, uh, states have flexibility in implementation of their, of their Medicaid programs and to use Medicaid dollars um, in a variety of ways that can address drivers of health. Um, on the left-hand side, you see you see the word state plan, and that just means that there, um, for a long for you know the history of the Medicaid program has given enough flexibility for states to fund things like the co the costs associated with care management and inclusive of linking people to social services programs to help people find housing, um, to provide assistance in finding and retaining employment. Those are are services that that state Medicaid programs can provide without any waiver under their existing authority at their, at their discretion. Managed care often, it also gives states even additional flexibility. Um, and you can see that um, uh, with the context of um, uh, withhold and incentive payments in lieu of services, um, those are all strategies within managed care that can enable um, plans to have more flexibility um, to pay for interventions that address drivers of health. And then um, over uh, to the right-hand side, um, also within managed care, you can see you know, things like um, adjust, doing risk adjustment for social um, factors. At this point, I think only Massachusetts is doing that in the context of their Medicaid program, but where they're actually um, taking into consideration social factors in determining um, what uh, the capitation rates are, what, what are being paid for um, individual Medicaid beneficiaries. There's a long history of, of adjusting risk based on health needs. This is an innovative effort to say, well, let's also look at social needs because we know that those social needs dramatically impact um, the, the, um, the interventions that individuals need and therefore the cost of their care. Um, so these are all strategies here that states have, um, or, or, or tools, authorities that states have to implement um, efforts to address drivers of health without needing special federal authority. And, um, and so I would just conclude by saying, I do think um, both leveraging the 1115 waiver authority and these other state authorities, we're gonna continue to see states really pushing the envelope and seeking to be creative in their efforts to improve health, improve health equity um, and reduce costs um, through by addressing drivers of health and, um, we just encourage everyone to um, continue to think about how we can bring the innovation that we're seeing across all payer systems into our Medicaid space where um, there are such opportunities and um, where the population is, really stands um, so much to benefit from it. So thank you. Thanks so much, Melinda. That was terrific. Um, Cam, I'll turn it over to you as our final speaker. 
Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for having me today. Again, I'm Cameron Webb. I'm a senior advisor on the White House COVID-19 response team. And in the context of today's conversation, as we talk about examining the social determinants of health, really wanted to, to take a, a different angle on this. The unique moment that the pandemic created it, as a crisis is that it created a really unique policymaking environment. So you've heard from, from previous presenters from Elevance and from Manat, talking really more about about kind of the specific dynamics from a payer perspective and how that intersects with states and even the federal government and the access side of things. But even more broadly, our ability to navigate social determinants of health, we can really lean into a lot of other policy strategies as well. So I wanted to, to use the pandemic and kind of my role on the COVID response team to illustrate uh, ways that we were able to take uh, a social determinants approach in some of the aspects of the pandemic response, but also to make the case that we can can and should continue to support these types of, of investments and expand them far beyond COVID-19. COVID-19 is a lens that we can talk about how to move toward more of these policy solutions and strategies uh, to address the, the drivers of health. So when it comes to COVID-19, you know, we started off, if you go back a couple of years, really early on, we realized the disproportionality in terms of COVID outcomes. And as you all know, that wasn't tied to any you know, genetic predisposition to bad outcomes with COVID. You know, it really was tied to the, the aggregate impact of social drivers, uh, the aggregate impact of, of kind of a burden of chronic disease that's also connected to social drivers. And so when we put all that together, we knew that certain communities were uh, you know, going to be harder hit and face higher risk with regard to the pandemic. And there are a lot of different factors that went into that. And if we're talking in terms of social drivers, uh, we could start off by talking about access to healthcare being one of the key ones, but also we could talk about employment, the risk that that uh, really, um, you know, imposed on some folks in terms of being frontline workers or essential workers. We can talk about, you know, housing density and the likelihood of, of folks who are working outside of the home or using public transportation and how bringing that back into households with more individuals and less uh, ability to, to socially or physically distance within the household led to more transmission within certain communities. All those things came together and you layer them on top of each other. And again, we saw you know, really disproportionate rates, three times or four times the rates of hospitalizations and deaths uh, often in communities of color. And so, you know, when this administration started in January of 21, we really wanted to center this idea of equity in uh, addressing the COVID-19 pandemic and inherent in that. It wasn't just the measuring of disparities or the measuring of inequities. It was also what is the, the lens of the approach that we have to take to drive equity and, and decidedly as a social determinants approach decidedly that's that's kind of tapping into some of those different societal dynamics that drive the inequities. So we started off with a couple of things. One of the first things that the president did was we uh, had a health equity task force that was pulled together. Dr. Marcella Nunez Smith was leading this. We pulled together experts from around the country and not only did they give advice on some of the, the key machinations of the COVID response, but also how we can connect these to different efforts across agencies in the federal government to really address some of those underlying social determinants that impacted the pandemic. And so, you know, that task force made over 300 different recommendations. They made a final list of 55 recommendations. And even at the time that they transmitted that report to us, you know, we had been taking their advice all along. By November of last year, we had started action on over 80% of those recommendations and even today we continue to look back to that those task force recommendations as a key mechanism for us to engage around those social determinants. The second piece I want to talk about is is Executive Order 13985, which was advancing equity and racial justice through the federal government. This was an executive order that the president put forward very early on in the administration, but really calling on all executive agencies to center this idea of equity. And I raised that here in a social determinants conversation because the equity work in the Department of Education or or housing and urban development, or H HHS, Health and Human Services, uh, you know, the work across these different agencies is inherently social determinants of health work. It is kind of at that core. And so by having equity action plans, by really having uh, this approach through the agencies uh, to drive equity, you know, that's also helping in the COVID-19 pandemic because we have concurrent policy that's being created to help create more uh, equitable uh, environments. And then finally, I, I want to talk about one of the tools that we use pretty regularly in our policy approaches, and I'll dive deeper on that uh, in, in a couple of seconds. But we used uh, pretty readily the Social Vulnerability Index, and a lot of you are familiar with that. But SVI, as it's known, it, it's typically a county-based metric. It measures social 
vulnerability, but it's looking at socioeconomic status. It's looking at various household characteristics, like the age of the individuals in the household, disability status, language proficiency. It's looking at race, ethnicity. It's looking at housing type. It's looking at transportation dynamics. And it's pulling those together to get a sense of who's most likely to be negatively impacted by something like a pandemic. And by using SVI in our approach to the pandemic, we were able to incorporate a lot of those different drivers of health in the allocation of resources and in the places where we really went first with a lot of our tools to address the pandemic. So when you, when you, you know, go to those resources and you talk about when the rubber meets the road, how did we do it? You know, start off talking about the vaccination effort, which, you know, as of next week, it's going to be two years old, right? We've had two years of this vaccination effort, a really important and critical tool to keep people safe in the pandemic but it's built on top of these dynamics of a lack of access to care in a lot of communities, uh, the ideas of uh, the reality of discrimination and also perceptions of discrimination, how that's going to layer on top. Uh, there's also a lot of dynamics in terms of immigration enforcement that I think a lot of people were concerned of early on. Right? We can list all the different factors that drove uh, the anticipation that we were going to have gaps in terms of vaccinations. Um, and there are others that I think are more directly tied to to some of the social drivers we've been talking about today. Uh, think about employment and paid time off as being one of the big drivers. And that's something we were able to navigate through funding that Congress appropriated to ensure that people have the ability to get paid time off from work if they're getting vaccinated for COVID-19. We can talk about childcare, uh, the lack of childcare and how that created dynamics where people couldn't go to get vaccinated because they didn't have space. So we worked and partnered uh, with the private sector to find child care uh, entities nationally who were able to provide free child care for folks if they're going to get vaccinated. Transportation was a huge issue. So, you know, states and localities really led the way on this by making sure that public transportation was taking people directly to vaccination sites. But then we worked with Uber and Lyft to also get people free rides to vaccination sites to try to navigate those social drivers. And then finally, a lot of the work that, that I was doing um, early on was going to different communities, talking to folks about uh, not just vaccines, but about the pandemic more broadly. We created this, what we called syndemic series, where we're going into communities, whether virtually or in person, and, and talking about the issues that already existed, the social determinants that were really top of mind, oftentimes mental health challenges, gun violence, whatever it may be, uh, food access, and we're talking about those, how they've been exacerbated by the pandemic, and how the vaccines were part of the path to address those core issues as well. Again, taking that lens was really helpful and we were able to close the gaps in, uh, in, in equities in terms of primary series vaccinations by November of last year. We see those gaps reemerge with boosters and we've been able to close those again with over 65 and 50 to 64, but the reason they reemerge is because you know, the structures and the dynamics across our society continue. They haven't been addressed. Those underlying causes of those inequities have not been adequately addressed. And that's where really the work has to continue. Uh, I know we're uh, a little running over time, so I want to go a little bit faster. But but in terms of testing, that's another area where I really wanted to talk about some of the dynamics in terms of social drivers that impacted COVID testing. And, and yes, access to care, again, being key there. But health literacy is an important one that we need to address. Linguistic appropriateness, housing density being another one. You know, we, we created a program uh, where we were sending tests to every single household, uh, but we couldn't just send the same number of tests to every household because, again, there are differences in terms of housing density. So we had to find ways to make sure we we're getting uh, the right number of tests to the right individuals. And sometimes that was challenging when you have kind of a a, a, I would say a crude tool from government to ship tests out, but at the same time, we're trying to make sure it's adaptable and augmented by other programs. And so in terms of strategies, we've been able to partner with housing and urban development to get testing into public housing spaces. We've been able to work with food banks to get testing to those spaces where people regularly go, folks who may be more income sensitive uh, and more likely to have some threats from that standpoint, getting tests to schools so families can get those. And so again, those are all strategies we also worked closely with community health workers and promotoras de salud. We worked with the National Association of Community Health Workers. We did priority sending of tests to people from, uh, you know, the highest uh, SVI, so most socially vulnerable zip codes in the country. They were prioritized for the shipping of their tests. We even had a reserve allocation that was that was uh, reserved specifically for high SVI zip codes. So those are some of the things we were able to do. You know, you'll continue to see that in our conversations around treatments like Paxlovid, the oral antiviral that can reduce the risk of hospitalization and death by 90%. That, you know, again, access to healthcare became a big challenge there. Uh, health literacy, paid time off, those are all some of the dynamics 
that make it hard for people to get access to treatment. And so we work to expand prescribers. We work to ensure that they're free. But I, I want to close by talking a little bit about the threats, because even though we've been able to mobilize a lot of resources and tools in the context of pandemic, those dollars aren't here anymore, right? The funding from Congress has, has dried up. We've made several requests that, that haven't been honored. And so at this point, that lack of funding from Congress, it's going to make it harder for us to continue with a lot of these community-based strategies, those investments, and kind of navigating those social drivers of health. And, and then you add on top of that the unwinding of the public health emergency, whenever that is, the impact it's going to have on access to health care, specifically through Medicaid, the impact it's going to have, you know, when you have that, that continuous uh, enrollment requirement that goes away and you're seeing those redeterminations, you know, there, there's a really strong likelihood people are going to lose, some people are going to lose their coverage. And what impact does that have on the ability to access these tools, these resources? And others, and that's where you know our work in kind of the commercialization of the pandemic is inherently equity work, trying to make sure that we can navigate some of those factors I already described to you. So I'll close by saying this: you know, two weeks ago we held a White House summit on uh, COVID-19 equity and a What Works symposium. We brought community-based organizations, local public health leaders, lots of folks from all over the country to share promising and best practices. And kind of the thread through those conversations was the navigation of these social drivers, the social determinants. Of health, and so that's going to continue to be really important. Uh, just today, actually, HRSA is mobilizing $350 million to federally qualified health centers all over the country, so that they can partner with community-based organizations uh, in their community to help get people connected to vaccines, the new updated vaccines that are going to be really important uh, in the event of a winter surge. And so the work continues. You know, we continue to work on the the broader equity mission, but I think that. The key takeaway I want you all to have is that there are levers we can pull from a federal perspective. Uh, we just need to continue to have the wherewithal from our legislative spaces to provide the resources so that we can partner really efficiently across government and continue to have that kind of impact. So with that, I'll turn it back and, and looking forward to the questions. Thank you so much, Cam. Um, I'd like to um, just thank all of our panelists again um, and ask everybody to turn your videos back on as we come into the question and answer um, portion of the conversation. Um, this is also a time for you, um, the attendees, to participate. So you can go into the question um, component of the GoToWebinar platform um, and put your questions in. We already have a few questions um, to get us started, but this is a great opportunity to be thinking about that. Um, I want to start with one directly from the audience. Um, I clearly, Cam, what, everything that you commented on, I think addresses it, but this is such a high level overarching question. I thought it was good to raise for all of the um, for all of the participants. They say, we have done a good job of collecting data and implementing ROI studies. We keep getting the same results that highlight the existence and impact of structural racism and discrimination uh, that prove the impact of interventions on SDOH and outline the impact of upstream efforts on long-term savings. So they have a question about how do we make this shift from continued evaluation and theoretical conversations to actually restructuring policies and implementing efforts that can affect change. What will it take to make this shift? Who's doing the work and where is the hope? That's the whole purpose of this conversation today. Um, so just really simple questions to kind of get us started. Um, but uh, Rakaya, um, can I ask you to start us off who, what will it take to make the shift? Who's doing the work and where is their hope? Thank you. So one of the key components of addressing structural discrimination and in particular structural racism is to name it and to name it and to actually require some action steps that will address it. Um, as I mentioned, regarding the health justice framework, that is one of the parts of it to actually name that structural discrimination is key. So that means as we take a look at Healthy People 2030, that we revise that framework to show that structural discrimination is a root cause and not just have a circle which has the five key factors as if they're separate from structural discrimination. It means that when we adopt regulations, rules, practices that we take that into consideration, which I think um, the current administration is trying to do, 
That means that when we look at some of our insurers that they in, uh, ask about structural discrimination, that they try to provide additional support from people who are suffering from that. That means that when we use the SBI, that we are intentional about who we are trying to track and what they actually need. And that it is not just about increasing the access perhaps to healthy foods, that we understand that this is a generational issue and so that we provide additional money and supports for individuals who have been harmed uh, for this uh, for decades. Um, and I am going to stop there, but I think it's just a more intentional focus, explicit focus. Um, let me add one other thing about, um, about this. I think the last point that I really want to highlight is that we cannot just have the same people who have been doing this work continue to do the work because part of the problem is that the communities who have suffered the most are not actually leading and driving the change. So to me, that is key. So what does that mean explicitly? That means that if you have me talking about these issues, you should all also have a community member talking about how they have suffered and what they need and what they want to address this change. And so requiring um, the federal government and any funding that they give, that it has to be a community partnership part of that and lead community people leading that as uh, what happened in the COVID-19 vaccine rollout for many states that they were required to work with communities. To me, that is a key. so much. I see a lot of um, nodding going on on the screen. Um, Shantanu, Melinda, uh, Cam, do you want to make any additions to that? Well, I, I I'll, just, I'll maybe follow up. Oh, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I was just going to say quickly, you know, the, the comment that, um, you know, we've been collecting and, and navel gazing, staring at data for a long time. That's very true. Right. I mean, this, you know, the, the inequities, this was in uh, W.E.V. Du Bois, the Philadelphia Negro in Chapter 10. Right. This doesn't this doesn't start with, you know, the Heckler report in 1985. This doesn't start with unequal treatment in 2003. This has been around. Right. We know these data. So so I think it's it's just a fallacy for people to suggest that we still need to collect data. I think action the time is now. And actually we're speaking with uh, CDC director Walensky just the other day. And, and she said we we have what we need. To move on it now it's just the time for action i think that's that's absolutely the case and if anybody suggests otherwise i think that uh we just need to really press in all spaces to tell people to walk and chew gum at the same time collect what you need but act on what you have love that thank you go ahead shantanu actually i i really agree with what's been said um i do think there's a lot of data that's been collected um uh you know i think uh, as we take actions to address social needs to improve health equity, we are also collecting data along the way to make sure those actions are having the right impact. Um, to me, I, I, I think the public sector has taken a strong leadership role, and, and I would certainly encourage that continuing. I think states, various states, have been really proactive, as Melinda pointed out, on these issues. Um, I think raising the bar, raising accountability and expectations, whether they do it through payment policies through quality measurement. Um, you know, my view is we should be taking an all of the above approach. Um, you know, CMS is now doing this in the Medicare program. I think I think that will have tremendous impact. Where, where I'd love to see, uh, maybe policy can play a role here, but, you know, a um, significant number of Americans are, are insured under employer-sponsored insurance. I think um, getting into that market is really important. We have those conversations with our employer customers. And, and partly why I think it's important to talk about the work that we can do with our own associates is to influence those customers to, you know, toward adopting similar approaches, um, you know, setting up a model for what they can do. But I think, I think that market is really critical because so many Americans get their insurance through it. Thank you so much. Go ahead, Melinda. Go ahead. Melinda, are you muted? Sorry. Um, 
I was just saying that I think that I think the observation about the importance of naming it is is so important and and one um, issue or one um, uh, challenge that I see is that as we look at integrating community voices and community based organizations and a different set of services and types of interven interventions um, to address and improve health, address drivers of health and improve health and improve health equity. Um, the standards that we often apply to that um, don't acknowledge um, the, the opportunity and the challenge at hand. And what I mean by that is, you know, frequently we, we talk about this in terms of ROI. Um, whereas, you know, if, if we had a cure for, um, you know, cancer, we wouldn't say, well, what's the ROI on that? If we can see that what we can do is improve health and improve health equity, um, the ROI is gravy on that but improving health and improving health equity is a value into itself and part of the mission and, and purpose of the Medicaid program and, and other publicly financed healthcare programs as well so being really clear about what why are we doing this is it purely about saving money or are we actually furthering the purpose of the program which is to improve health and improve health equity um, and then second and a second example of where you know I, I um, can be frustrated is we often then kind of with that ROI lens say, well, we think about our investments in those community resources in the kind of old fee-for-service um, healthcare context where we're like, well, we'll pay someone for a food box and um, that's kind of as much as we can do to, to form the solution as opposed to thinking about, you know, um, or we'll just refer someone. Um, to a food bank, and that's kind of the end of our job as a, as a healthcare organization. When we know that that food bank is already overtaxed, um, when we know that in order for that organization CBO to be a true partner, they're going to need a different kind of set of capabilities and IT and financial wherewithal and um, you know uh, expertise and and voice in in negotiating terms and that sort of thing and. You know, I, I think about the journey on value-based payment and how, you know, we, the, our investment in the primary care infrastructure, I think that our social services um, sector, we should be thinking about in those same terms. Like, it's going to require upfront investment. This isn't going to just magically happen by focusing on an ROI um, at the end of the day. And, and I, the, that's a very technical, long-winded way of saying, I think that starts with the naming it um, that Professor Yerby was, was, uh, was referencing. Thank you so much, um, uh, Cam. I love your um, quote, collect what you need, act on what you have. I think that could just be another motto um, for today. And so just on the topic of measurement, because you know there's been a lot of attention and, and progress in this space, um, should we be concerned about duplication of effort and lack of coordination among the range of entities, whether it's states, health plans, providers, um, federal government, all aiming to identify and address drivers of health, social drivers of health, um, in kind of their own unique way. Um, how concerned are you about that, you know, the different approaches um, that are out there? Melinda, maybe I'll um, start with you just given the, the measurement work, but if others want to um, comment on that, I'll open it up. I, I um, and wrote down, um, Cameron's um, statement, and I'm going to use that constantly. I mean, I think it's, there's going to be some amount of chaos for a while, right? We're, it's going to take a while for us all to converge around common tools and common measures. And, it, and in no circumstance in healthcare do we sit back and wait until we think we have everything perfectly aligned across all players before we forge, forge ahead with trying to create incremental progress and you know in my slides on the that was kind of my point on that screening it looks a little bit like chaos right now but it, it is movement and I think we we need federal leadership to help guide that movement um, and partnership between state and federal um, uh, regulators to help guide that movement but we can't sit back and wait um, for us all to come to consensus about um, a, a single approach we we need some of that chaos to inform and create momentum um, towards that convergence. Shantanu, do you want to, oh, sorry, go ahead, Kim, and then Shantanu. I was just going to add from, from my perspective, 
in, in federal government doing this work, you know, I, I can't tell you how many times a week I say there are things that we can do from the federal government and there are things that don't make sense for us to do. And oftentimes, you know, I engage with community-based organizations who say, we, we've got a way that we can do this in this community in North Birmingham, Alabama, you know, how can the federal government support us? And what I say is, it, it, you know, it shouldn't necessarily be the role of the federal government to decide exactly what CBO in what neighborhood and what community. We just have to create the environment to help make that possible, right? And we need to lift those examples and shine a light on those and say, look at what's happening in North Birmingham and Alabama. How can we rally local public health leaders, state leaders, and also the federal government, also our partners across agencies to help get the job done. And so I think a lot of it is making sure that, you know, yeah, I think I think Melinda's absolutely right. You know, everybody needs to be doing work with all deliberate speed. I think that what happens from here though is that as we continue to go, we continue to iterate and we find the different spaces, the different roles for everybody within the work. But I think, you know, I engage with a lot of community organizations in this work and I don't think a single one of them would, would tell any of us to sit back and and wait and plan and figure out who should be doing what. They they need all hands on deck. Yeah, I'll, I'll add to that. I, I agree with uh, what Cameron and Melinda said. So, you know, first of all, Rachel, to your question, um, it's healthcare, so naturally it's fragmented and there's duplication of effort. That's kind of what we do. Um, but I, I think what's what's great is there is an infrastructure for bringing more consistency and uniformity. Let's use the infrastructure. So. I'll put in a plug for my former organization, National Quality Forum. Let's use the NQS to help um, decide what the best measures are. NCQA obviously is a leader in this and, and can play an important role. So, you know, there's an existing infrastructure. I think we do tend to underutilize it. We don't align around consistent solutions when we have the opportunity to do so. At the same time, I, I agree with what's been said. We have to start um, solving issues. We have to, you know, sort of put our programs in motion. Um, and let perhaps some of these consistent solutions catch up to them. So the one thing, so I agree with what's been said. The one thing maybe I'll, I'll, I'll say a few words about is um, in working with a variety of CBOs, as you all know, they are in really different places. They have a vastly different levels of resourcing and staffing, et cetera. I, I think as we bring, bring the sort of gigantic machinery of healthcare into this space, we have to be really thoughtful not to adversely harm the ecosystem. Um, and so we, we come with accreditation requirements and measurement requirements and reporting requirements and HIPAA and other things. I would just ask policymakers to really think about the intersection of our existing infrastructure with CBOs and other social resources so that we don't accidentally crush these really important actors that have been working in the space for uh, a long time. Uh, let's bring a light touch approach, figure out how we resource them, um, certainly how we get members and patients to be able to access their their resources, um, but without uh, unnecessary uh, oversight and requirements. Thank you and so I much. I want to jump in with that yeah. to say that to me it means that there's going to need to be a different way of grant making and a different way of funding. And so what we have prized ourselves on is competition instead of collaboration. And so one of the things that we have done at the Institute for Healing Justice, we are working with Barbara Wood Johnson to help them in grant making. And we did so by creating a consortium of experts. So then you're not competing, you're bringing expertise together and you're funding a group to work together to do these issues. The same should be done with community-based organizations. One of the things that Robert Johnson has done is to fund an organization to provide admin support for the community group so that they can do the work, but they're not responsible for the requirements of reporting back and things like that. So I think what we need to do, if we are serious about community-led change is to change the model uh, fund them to collaboratively work together and fund them so that they can have some administrative support to continue to do the amazing work that they are doing. That's great. Really, really critical um, component, especially as we hear more emphasis on involving um, the community and community-based organizations. Um, we're we're quickly running out of time, but I want to um, I want to get it this one um, also from the audience. 
Um, we've talked a lot about screening and how essential that is to understand what services and supports are needed. However, to be screened, one really needs to be connected um, and successfully navigating the healthcare uh, or social services system, right? Um, so how are those without ties to the healthcare infrastructure or social um, service system um, being accommodated? And, you know, in um, other cases such as limited English profici proficiency or hearing loss or vision loss, there's a lot of other you know, um, issues and factors people may be bringing to the table that could complicate, um, you know, again, what looks on paper like a very exciting, you know, move in the right direction on screening. How are we kind of taking a holistic approach and making sure that that is really inclusive of the populations um, that are most likely to get missed if we're, if we're not thoughtful about that? And um, I'll open that up to whoever wants to, to start. Well, I will say I think this is another example of advantage that community-based organizations can can bring or a strength that they bring um, in terms of, you know, when I was a legal services attorney, um, people came to me when they didn't have food in their cupboards, when they were under threat of eviction, when they um, were fearful of losing their children. They're far, those are moments of crisis that far outweigh whether I'm getting my primary, keeping up with my primary care visits. And, um, the community-based organizations that, you know, I think a lot of times we think about, well, we find them here in the healthcare environment, and then we will ask the community-based organization to come in and deliver this food box, as opposed to thinking about the ecosystem within which people are moving and, and their, you know, priorities in terms of their own, um, managing their own lives. And, and community-based organizations can help us identify people who are also experiencing um, health crises or um, chronic conditions that are going untreated or, you know, um, they can be a doorway through which we're bringing, um, bridging between health and human services to get to, to help people improve their lives. And um, so, I, you know, I, I kind of think it brings us back to um, the conversation before about, so how do we do that in ways that don't medicalize our CBO partners and um, and how does the financing work and, and you know, how do we structurally um, ensure that they're the, the um, systems, information systems, et cetera, to enable that to happen. But I, I, I view that as kind of a core part of the problem that we're trying to solve. Thank you, Melinda. Um, we are at our time. I'm gonna ask one final question and give everyone the opportunity um, for um, final comments. Um, given that the audience that we have today, and again, thanks to everyone for taking your Friday lunch to join us, um, predominantly um, focused on federal policy, working for federal policymakers, assisting them, advising. Um, I would love just to, to hear from all of you as we close, um, what's the most critical step a federal policymaker could take today to accelerate action um, on social drivers of health and to really enhance health of all Americans and get at some of these issues um, that we've been talking about. Um, Cam, you're sitting at a hub of a lot of activity, so maybe I'll start with you. What's the one thing that you would love to see um, federal policymakers accelerate? Um, and we'll go around the screen. I mean, I could I could do this all day, but we could start with pass a budget. Uh, let's do that, uh, and and so I think that's a that's a good start and a comprehensive one, right? We've been doing a lot of continuing resolutions. Let's get an omnibus going. Let's let's make sure we're funding a lot of the aspects of government so we can fund access to healthcare in a thoughtful and meaningful way as a foundational part of all this work. Um, you know, the the dollars are going to be a big part of this. And I think that um, that uh, you know our legislators have a big role to play in making sure that this ecosystem is well supported um, from a funding standpoint to help keep the movement going. Thank you. Shantanu? Thank you. Um, I'd say probably broadly um, incentivize shifting resources to addressing this area. So it, with all sort of available levers. Right, so I think somebody mentioned earlier uh, risk adjustment, maybe it was Melinda, um, risk adjustment. I, I think you can certainly think about risk adjusting payments, um, risk adjusting measurement, let's put more measurement against this, um, let's um, rejigger the medical loss ratio so that literally it's every actor in the ecosystem, payer, provider, and otherwise, is, it, you know, the incentives are clearly 
uh, aligned to address social needs, to address health equity. Um, I think that's a major leverage point. It's not the only one, but I, I think it's really critical. Thank you. Uh, Rakaya? Sorry, it took me a second to unmute. To me, because a majority of workers, a um, majority of individuals in the United States receive health insurance, health access through employment, that we really have to ensure that everybody has access to health insurance. And I, when I mean, when I say access, I mean that they can actually pay for it and use it, particularly for those who are working in the healthcare system, providing access to healthcare, and they cannot get access to healthcare themselves. So I think employment changes so that everybody can have true access. Um, so I want to say all of the above, um, and I guess just to add one more um, piece on this, on the financing piece of it, um, I think also at the federal level, um, helping to develop mechanisms to solve for the wrong pocket problem, and that this goes back to, it, it, it goes beyond that I completely agree with um, what Shantanu was saying about aligning financial incentives and mechanisms within our healthcare system, but bridging them across because particularly as we think about um, our population's children, people experiencing homelessness, justice-involved populations, that wrong pocket problem is a huge barrier for us to, um, to do that alignment and, and make the change we need. Thank you so much. And just a final thank you for all of our um, speakers. This has been a really terrific um, conversation. And I also could keep going all afternoon, but I think we would eventually run out of our um, run out of our time with um, GoToWebinar. So um, thank you again for um, all of our attendees that have um, been with us um, over the course of this conversation. Um, please take time to complete the brief evaluation survey that you will receive immediately after the broadcast ends as well as via email later today. Um, keep an eye out on the Alliance website for details about future upcoming events, um, and know that a recording of this webinar, um, all of the materials, um, slides, um, and background readings will also be made available. Um, so with that, thank you again to our um, presenters. It was a terrific conversation, and thanks to all of you for joining us. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you.